Hello, I'm Steve Balch, director of the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, and this is one of our Institute Encounters in which we have a chat uh, with one of the scholars that we bring to Texas Tech to talk about the, the big questions that are the major concern of the Institute. And today we're very privileged to have Professor Lawrence Mead of New York University who's done a great many things in his time. Uh, he's at Texas Tech to speak about his latest interest, which is American and Western culture and its distinctiveness. Uh, but today I think we're going to take a look at another side of his career, um, the one that, that first brought him to national prominence, uh, and that is the role he played not only as a policy analyst, uh, but as a policy advisor in which he helped reshape national and state level uh, welfare policy. Uh, much of this took place back in the 1990s as part of the great welfare reforms of that time. So he's not only a scholar, uh, but he's also a consequential public policy leader. And mm -hmm. thank you very much for, for being here, Larry. Um, First off, uh, tell me a little bit about what made you interested yeah. in welfare policy. Well, when I first came to NYU, uh, that was in 1979, uh, I brought with me from Washington a set of interests about poverty and welfare. And the thing that grabbed me most was the fact that the poor, and especially people on welfare, didn't seem to have any obligations. They were seen as claimants on various rights and benefits. And they certainly need help, and they certainly need rights and benefits. But what was missing to me was any idea that they had responsibilities. And as I've experienced American life, my own life, and other people, it seems to me that's an important part of being an American, that you have certain responsibilities. And indeed, uh, public opinion polls show that the public is very concerned that poor people display a set of responsibilities, like working and obeying the law and so on and so on, and that concern is actually greater than concern they might have about the cost of social programs. So their main concern isn't actually to save money on, on poverty programs, but to be sure that those receiving the benefits do something in return, that there's a sense of reciprocity. And so I studied the question of work requirements in welfare, which had already appeared uh, the question was whether people drawing welfare should have to work in return for those benefits. And it turned out that this is a subject which had not received a lot of attention. And furthermore, there was a general belief that it was futile, that it wasn't really possible to expect people to work when they were poor and disadvantaged. Uh, it seemed to me, however, based upon the research experience I had in Washington, that actually they could work, uh, many could work anyway, and that to do that would be popular and effective as a way of dealing with poverty. So this was in the 1990s, yeah. and you're taking on yeah. what you're describing here yeah. as sort of an established mindset with respect yeah. to this policy area. Um, it's a mindset in which yeah. you get benefits without having really to do anything in return. That's right. How did that get established in the first well, place? Well, I think it, it came out of the Great Society period in the 60s and 70s in which the poor were seen primarily as disadvantaged due to social neglect or injustice in various forms, and there certainly was injustice. This is before uh, Jim Crow was established, or rather abolished, and therefore there was a reason to think that many poor people simply lack opportunity. So in that period, the 60s and 70s, the focus was on building up opportunity and benefits for people who had been disadvantaged. Uh, and then in the 80s, it became clear that that wasn't actually solving the problem, because although you can make people better off by giving the benefits, it didn't lead to integration. It didn't really lead to the end of poverty as a problem. Uh, and it's at that point that pressure for uh, employment among people on welfare or other poor people became stronger. Uh, and it was that was the point when I got interested in this problem. And I began to do my own studies. And I actually had done some studies in Washington as part of a research team at a think tank. And in, uh, in those studies and later ones that I did at NYU, I was able to establish that whether poor adults went to work was a function of largely whether they were expected to, rather than economics, rather than incentives. 
And meanwhile, economists were pursuing the idea that we could make work attractive to people by improving the incentives when you go to work, such that, for example, you could keep part of your welfare if you went to work. You didn't immediately lose it all if you took a job. So you'd have a reason to go to work. I didn't find that was important. What important was really whether the program had authority to expect people to work. And I was able to show that that was, in fact, the main determinant of whether they went to work. And, and there were yeah. differences at the state level between other programs uh, as a yes. or not? Uh, what, what I found was that the, pro, the states, localities within the state and then across the states, the states that were more demanding in terms of expecting people to participate in work program, they were the ones that achieved uh, the most employment, actually. And meanwhile, this is in the 80s now, in the 80s also we began to do evaluations. I didn't do them, but I was involved in it. Evaluations of existing work programs which confirmed what I had found, that programs that were demanding and expected people to work also showed impacts. They actually caused increases in employment. And the, the minute that uh, finding became known in about oh, 1984, 85, around in there, from that point on, the, the welfare debate was largely about how far one should push work requirements, how far one should expect people to work. And I went on publishing my studies, and then there was another big legislation the big enactment by Congress in 1988 called the Family Support Act, in which for the first time serious uh, work programs were set up to require people on, work, on welfare to go to work. Now the, that program was not terribly demanding, it didn't actually change the system very much, but it was a step down the road. And then in the 90s you get the more radical change that occurred in 1996, when work requirements were enormously increased. So what you're talking yeah. about here is, since most these programs are administered directly by the state or local yes. governments. Yes. You're talking about uh, the federal government attaching yes. uh, conditions to the aid that it gives That's to state right. governments for That's those right. purposes. As a matter of fact, the federal condition was initially on the state and not on the recipient directly. The federal government said, um, if we give you money to run a welfare program, you, the state, must ensure that some share of the recipients who could be working are actually in a work program. They're actually working or they're in a program, and uh, that that should be a goal. And that began to be achieved in the early 90s, and then after the enactment of 96, the, uh, that movement accelerated enormously. And you had uh, serious work requirements in at least the part of welfare that was subject to these requirements. When, when I say welfare, I'm primarily talking about cash welfare for poor families, what was then known as aid to families with dependent children. And under the new enactment of 96, it became temporary assistance for needy families. And under that enactment, states were under an obligation to get half of their recipients involved in work activities over several years. And by the late 90s, half the, the clients were supposed to be in some kind of work activity. So that was a revolution, and it led to an enormous drop in the welfare rules. A lot of mothers simply left welfare and went to work directly. Uh, and the result was a big increase in work levels, some reduction in poverty, and uh, uh, really a change in the whole social problem as we understood it. So this was a revolution. Now I assume there's a yeah. good deal of resistance to doing this when it happened. Um, uh, among the elite, yes. Uh, that is, among researchers, academics, liberal politicians, there was resistance. Not entirely. The, there was a fair amount of democratic support for the enactment of both the Family Support Act in 88 and the uh, Personal Responsibility Act, it was called, in 96. Drew did draw some democratic support, but it was primarily a conservative idea, and it was conservatives who pushed it through Congress. And then Bill Clinton signed it really under pressure. Now, he personally agreed with the basic idea that recipients should work. His own proposals were more moderate. The Republican bill was actually more extreme. He signed it, however, believing that it was the best thing to do, and it turned out well in general. How did, I mean, if you take a yeah. look at the various interests, constituencies, yeah. and groups that would be affected by this, yeah. um, how, how did the social work community react yeah. to these? Well, ideas? the social work community was totally opposed, and they had been opposed to any attempt to condition or restrict welfare going back to the 60s and even before. And the result was they never really came to terms with the employment issue. And it, may, it really made them irrelevant to the whole debate. So they were, I would say, on the sidelines. Then among the research community in the academic world, they were mostly opposed as well, 
because their whole concept of poverty was that people were entrapped in a whole set of social barriers that prevented them working and doing other good things, and therefore it was pointless to expect them to work. Uh, and so they, their basic idea was that poverty is the result of, of denials of opportunity, of various social barriers that make it difficult for people to work and support themselves. So you might say that their prediction was falsified by uh, I the I would result. say so. Mm -hmm. I would say so. My view is almost the opposite of theirs, and that was that the poor were not lacking of freedom, rather they were all too free, that they didn't have to work, that the solution was not freedom but obligation. And that was the really radical thought here, that actually to require work is the thing that would lead to work, rather than to facilitate work through various new benefits and opportunities. And I have to say that ever since then, the academic view has not changed. The typical academic is still looking for barriers out there that will uh, cause people to go to work, but there's no evidence that it will. The, uh, the thing that is missing is obligation. So if we uh, analogize that to uh, other areas of life, we might say, if you're looking for familial happiness, don't wait for love to come along, just get married to somebody. <laughs> uh, well, in, the, in a way that's right. I think one of the reasons why I, I went down this road, I think, is that I had not experienced my own life or American life in general to be about freedom. It seemed to me it was mostly about people fulfilling their responsibilities, mm -hmm. that American life was actually quite taxing, it, it made great demands on people, they had to work hard, they had to compete. Uh, so, where is this freedom? I don't ever recall being free in that sense. Rather, I had opportunity, but to seize that opportunity, I had to work hard, and I expected to do that. And much of the reward came from that, not from claiming a right, but being fulfilled, the ability to fulfill my responsibilities. And poor, poverty was distinct in that this is the only group in the society of whom really no expectations were made. They had rights and no obligations. So my basic idea was that for them to be integrated was not really about rights, but really about obligations. They needed to have the same set of obligations as other people, as well as the same rights. I'm not against equal rights, but uh, you must also have the same responsibilities and you must be expected to function. And if you don't have that, then you're not free and you're not equal. Whatever people say, you're not actually equal. It's by shouldering those responsibilities you actually claim your membership in the society. So I can see how this carries over into the contemporary work you're doing. Yes, on, there is on, that. On, there is some parallel. Um, how mm -hmm. did how did these various uh, areas, pockets of resistance among uh, yeah. bigger than pockets, I guess, yeah. among the research community and the uh, social work community, uh, what happened when they began to see the results? Did their minds change? Uh, no, not fundamentally. What they did, however, accept was that employment was a crucial dimension of welfare reform and that it had to be promoted somehow. They still were resistant to the idea of enforcement. See, liberals don't oppose work. What they oppose is enforcing work, requiring work as a condition of something else. So a lot of people got more interested in employment and they certainly did things to promote employment in various ways. And we've done other things to promote employment. For example, we did increase work incentives through the, through the earned income tax credit, which was enormously increased during uh, the late 90s. <clears throat> and that was certainly a factor that led to more higher work levels. So that is a positive thing, and, and many liberals supported that. Uh, what they didn't do, though, is go very far down the road of, of extending this basic analysis to any new areas. There are other areas, too, where you might see that obligations are important. Uh, in fact, there is some success in other areas of social policy that reflects the same idea. During the 70s and 80s, there was an enormous increase in penalties for crime. Society got much more serious about enforcing good behavior in terms of crime. And starting in the 90s, crime actually started to fall. Some of that, although only some, was due to tougher enforcement. And then in the schools, another key area, uh, there's been an effort to increase standards. So in all these areas, the, uh, the public has supported uh, stronger standards and, and greater expectations for good behavior. And, and all those requirements have been opposed various ways by the intellectual class. They basically don't approve of enforcing anything. They want to provide more benefits and opportunities. They, they do want to see better functioning, but they don't want to enforce it. Now, the poor, however, themselves are in favor. That is, one of the puzzles is they themselves think they should be working. Uh, they support that. Uh, they believe in work requirements. It's only the advocates that oppose it. The advocates for the poor oppose all that. 
but they're not speaking for the people that they claim to represent, who actually uh, favor it. And why do you think that's the case? I think it's because they're different from the people they claim to represent. See, the typical advocate is someone who is actually quite functional, someone who works hard, who does all the respectable things, and for that person, indeed, freedom is essential, opportunity is essential. They themselves have progressed by claiming opportunities. They don't see how that ability to claim the opportunities is dependent on their own obligations and their own responsibilities. So they project their mentality back on the people that they represent, and they say, these people also need opportunities, such as I have had. But that isn't true. What they primarily need is order. They primarily need a structure in which they can be expected to function. So we have to accept that those who are trying to help here are not like ourselves. We have a capacity to, to function that reflects a set of inner, inner inhibitions, obligations that we've learned usually early in life, and we fulfill those, and that's why we get ahead. But for the poor, for various reasons, that hasn't happened. So for them, it, there has to be outside authority. You have to actually expect them to do the thing, which they want to do. They're not against it. It's only because they want to do it that enforcement is possible. You're not making them do something they don't want to do. In some ways, that's the mystery of poverty, that people, in fact, want to work, want to get through school, obey the law. They want to do all the things that middle-class people want to do, but their capacity to do that is, for some reason, very limited. And yet, we can't explain it from any clear-cut set of barriers. And the search for barriers has really failed. We can't explain how this happens. So, yeah. would, uh, would you recommend sort of carrying this philosophy into <clears throat> other areas where public policy impacts on poverty, and, and if yeah. so, what else would you recommend? Well, the other areas where I've already mentioned would include primarily criminal justice, education. Those are the three. The big three really are the schools, the welfare system, and criminal justice. In these areas, uh, you see a breakdown of functioning. It's hard for people from low incomes to get through school, to stay on the right side of the law, to work consistently. Well, let's take school as an yeah. example. Um, you know, you can offer them, you can raise standards. Yeah. Uh, you can show them that, mm -hmm. uh, at least in some respects, an education helps you get ahead. Yeah. That's really dealing with the incentive system. Yeah. Uh, you can't, in the same way that you can get somebody to do work, you can't get them to learn simply by putting them in some situation where yeah. learning becomes inescapable. Um, so how, how, how does well, that happen? Well, actually, you can create incentives for the schools to function mm -hmm. better, okay. and federal education programs have tried to do that. They provide some money to the schools, although it's mostly state and local, and there are performance measures connected to that money, traditionally, which have put pressure on the schools to perform better. But your point about the students is correct. They, they basically do what they're told, and they have to be uh, required to meet higher standards, and we have moved in that direction. And if we do that effectively, uh, then, in fact, students do learn better. So the schools actually confirm my basic analysis that the, the answer is obligation rather than freedom. We came to this conclusion as well due to the failure of simply, of simply money to so, in, in solve the school's problem. I mean, ever since the 60s, it's been clear that the main problem in the schools isn't that there's insufficient resources. It's rather that the students are coming from weak families often where they don't really get support and they aren't clearly directed to learn by their parents, and they come to school and then they basically can't do it because they don't know that they should do it and not ready to do it. So what we've had to do is create schools that are much more structured, which become almost like a family, where the teachers become more effective authority figures than the parents and set standards for the students. Well, well I guess perhaps the analogy to being put in a workplace and then yeah. working and then feeling after a while that... Uh, uh, it's part of your obligation yeah. to work, would be to put be put into a school that had a very strong esprit de corps, sense yeah. of common identity, maybe yeah. they wear uniforms, strict discipline. Is, yes, is that that's what right. you're thinking about? Yeah, correct. KIPP Academy, for example. Uh, the KIPP Academy about. is really the origin of the, the kind of school I've just described, the high-performing charter school, where standards are set not only about academics, but also about order, that those schools insist on a high degree of public order. They do not allow students to uh, rap on each other or get involved in fights or be distracted from learning. They have to focus on their studies. 
and uh, they then have clear-cut standards. Now, they also help students who fall behind. It's not all severity. There's a lot of extra help for people who, who fall behind, but the standards are clear, and it's all about structure. It's really not freedom. It's not freedom that solves the problem. It's only by uh, functioning in a certain way that you get through the school, and then later on in life, when you are equipped, you are now ready to live a free life, but you can't do that right off the bat, mm -hmm. and freedom is really not the answer. But it's really hard to convince Americans who believe in freedom to uh, see this because they don't perceive the degree to which their own freedom depends upon the inner obligations that they have learned in strong families and, and through growing up in this society. So it isn't actually the case. It's invisible to them because they themselves have not known anything else. That's, that's yeah. right. And they've inter it's completely, um, completely unconscious. And so people who come out of standard middle class backgrounds and become advocates for the poor they want their own people to have the same opportunities and rights and all that. But that doesn't help the poor function because what they primarily need is structure. They need somebody to tell them what they're supposed to do. Can you create families? Uh, can you yeah. help poor families come together and provide that sort of structure from the uh, outset? I think there's actually this is an aspect of these new schools which they have not well developed. They usually give up on the parents and essentially, essentially try to to socialize the child within the school and don't expect anything from the parents. But it stands to reason that if you can somehow get the family more engaged, that the children will do better. The families in these cases have chosen to send their children Correct. to these schools, so Correct. they're selected for some degree uh, of responsibility well, maybe so, outside. maybe so, but then they don't, this also is true of schools that the students have not chosen. Mm -hmm. if those schools have the same structure, then the student has to go, but the student doesn't mind going usually. The problem is they're not engaged because they don't believe in in the school initially because they've given up on their parents. A very persuasive um, book about this was written recently by a good friend of mine named Hugh Price, uh, who's a successful black lawyer. He uh, headed the National Urban League for 10 years. And his own observation about the school problem is that the core problem is that the students have essentially given up on their parents in, in infancy almost. And, and they therefore have given up on them. And when they come to school, they also distrust the teachers. And they have to be brought around to, 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 to trust the teachers in a way that they haven't trusted their parents. And the students have given up on their parents. Yes. And, and, and in fact, the, the teachers have to win the trust of the students first. And it's only after that bond is formed that they can finally learn. So the, school, the problem in the schools isn't really academic at all. It's really psychological has to do with a lack of a bond between the child and the adult. Uh, and according to you, with a, an effective school, and his, his model here is actually the military, which man, manages to do this, um, the, with an effective school, you, bring, you, you establish that bond, and then uh, the students are able to function in a way that they could not before. Does having an intact two-parent family make a great difference? It does. For it does. Process? I mean, the, there's clear evidence that a two-parent family is much better able to prepare the child for school than a single parent. There, the main reason is that you have two parents who can give the child more attention and tell the child what to do and not do. And that's what forms the child as ready to learn. In a middle-class school, um, my kids go to uh, a middle-class school, quite a selective one in, in, in Manhattan, and they come in the door eager to learn because they're coming from families where they've been well prepared. And when uh, the teacher appears, they transfer to the teacher the trust and attention they're used to giving to their parents. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, they learn easily. So it's all about the psychology of the relationship between the child and the authority figure. And so the effective schools are all about reestablishing that bond. And then from that point, learning is possible. So what are the public policy initiatives that seem to work with respect to yeah. strengthening family? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know that we know how to do that directly. The thing that I would focus on mostly is uh, deterring unwed pregnancy. It's necessary mm -hmm. to have more two-parent families where the father is in the picture, the father is either married to the mother or is in some stable relationship. And it's clear that if you just have a single parent, uh, usually a mother, the child has a, a big handicap in terms of really everything later in life. So we can't ignore this. We have to try to do something to prevent unwed pregnancy and keep parents together. If we do that, then there's every reason to think that the child will be better going to school. And what are the trend lines there? Well, they've been pretty hostile up to now. I mean, typically 
uh, overall, the American population, about 40% of children were born outside marriage. Uh, for Hispanics... As opposed to, say, 30 years ago? Or uh, it, years would ago? Have been, it would have been, back in the 60s, it would have been like 10%. So there's a big increase. But the really dramatic increase is in, among minorities. Uh, for Hispanics, the figure today is 55%. For blacks, is 70%. So for blacks and Hispanics, marriage is really disappearing in these communities, and that's terrible for them. That really means that their children are starting is to die. Is that a function of bad public policy or just the culture in general? Uh, I would say mostly the culture in general. Uh, there are a number of theories as to why it's happening, why men are basically giving up on the family and uh, deserting the family. Uh, they uh, tend to break up with the mothers for various reasons. Um, the usual view is that men or uh, can't get good jobs today unless they're more skilled than they are and therefore they give up on supporting the family. The trouble with that theory though is that wages are still much higher today than they were in the past when men were more loyal to the families. So it isn't clear why men are giving up. I think the cultural explanation is more important that um, it just marriage is just not as believed as much as an obligation. The norm is still accepted. People still think norm of marriage is a great idea, but they don't actually fulfill it. Now that's true for the middle class as well, where divorce is at higher levels than it used to be. But for those families, the, um, uh, typically the parents stay together uh, and the child gets a much better chance as a result. Could be to some degree, I know some people argue that there's a kind of um, sort of sexual marketplace out mm -hmm. there in the world. Yeah. Uh, and if sex becomes too readily available yeah. for males, that's right. And it becomes readily available in part because of the culture, but in part because women yeah. can have children and be supported, and perhaps they sometimes prefer that to having a man around. Uh, uh, well, neither party is as interested in getting I married think as truth, might have been. I, I think there's truth to that. I don't think that women prefer to be single. I think that's too strong. They prefer to be married to a man that's reliable, but they have a hard time finding reliable men because the men have become less functional than they used to be. And why that is true is unclear. It really goes back to the 60s. That's when you start to see a loss of male work level, when they start to working less, especially unskilled men. Used to be they would work at available jobs, even low-wage jobs, and that allowed them to be, to be husbands and fathers at home. And now they don't do that as much. They tend not to work. And But the problem isn't only lack of jobs because the, the decline of marriage among blacks extends it well into the middle class. I mean, if 70% if of children are born outside marriage among blacks, that includes much of the middle class as well as the low-income population. So do the, do the women in that <clears throat> circumstance manage to maintain their middle class status? Uh, it's tougher. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably can. Many of them are employed themselves. And, and part of the reason for the change is that women have become more demanding. They're less likely to accept an unreliable man as a husband. So and, and it's hard to disagree with that. But it goes back to the fact that men have somehow lost the discipline they used to have. Women have also, but not so dramatically, the really, the really dramatic fall off is in work, uh, in, in male willingness to work, stay on the right side of the law, et cetera. All those problems have become more severe. So one would think that a woman might be more apt to make stronger demands on a husband or to have a higher expectation of what a yeah. husband should be if she's going to marry, even yeah. though she may prefer to have children, if A, uh, there is some public policy out there that supports her, or B, maybe, uh, there are just more jobs available uh, to well, people jobs, and, and they can and take them and yeah. live at a satisfactory level without having a second wage earner. Uh, that's, I think the latter is the more plausible view. Women today, it used to be when welfare was first created a long time ago, in the, in the 30s, really before then, the assumption was that a woman w was really physically unable to tend her family and also work. And that's why welfare initially assumed that the mother would not be working. And it's only after mothers went to work in large numbers in the 60s, on and off welfare, that we changed to the idea that the mother should now work. And it's better, we also know it's better for the child if she does that, aside from the money. Um, but. Um, the, uh, the typical mother today can usually scrape by with a job and also claiming remaining benefits that she's still eligible for, like earned income tax credit, food stamps, and so on. Those benefits are still available to her. What's going on in Europe? With uh, well, to this, the issues are parenting. actually rather similar. Hmm. Uh, I mean, the thing, one thing that's similar is that uh, I really don't have any competition as a theorist of work requirements, even in Europe. You'd think that they would have had 
other academics uh, arguing this policy, but no, they don't. So I, I'm in, actually spoken several times at European conferences. I'm involved in a project now on conditionality, as it's called, in, in Britain. Um, and uh, I'm, the, I'm the Darth Vader, the guy who says that people <laughs> ought to work. And other academics, though they may admit the practical necessity of this, they don't actually want to say it or endorse it openly. So Europe is doing the same thing. And that's contrary to what many academics think in this country. They generally believe that Europe is more generous than America and that Europe gives uh, money on an entitlement basis. That is, all you have to do is be poor in some way and then they give you an income. We don't ask questions about work or about anything about your lifestyle. Well, that was true once. I mean, 20 years ago, that was largely the case in most European countries. But they are moving away from that. They see a need, as we do, to move towards work requirements, not primarily to save money, but because they fear the development of a whole sector of society that's going to be outside the mainstream. And, but it's not so much the policy analysts, because you're still uh, there, at least yeah, the voice correct. of the wilderness. It's the practical yeah, politics. It's, it's government itself. And I mean, the most dramatic case is in Britain, where both parties have moved towards a much more demanding stance, mm -hmm. stance on, on work requirements, but the intellectuals are all opposed. And they just don't accept the argument for this, either the political or the practical argument for it. So they but oppose the, it. So if you look at the yeah. middle class, though, yeah. uh, Charles Murray yeah. tells us that um, uh, they don't um, uh, they, they, they don't preach what they, they practice, practice, right? Correct. So uh, they're, um, they have returned to yeah. a kind of more traditional marriage setup, yeah. but haven't abandoned the ideology of freedom. In, in, in this well I, I, I don't know that we should I don't know that the middle class in America is united about this I mean public opinion show, polls show that the public strongly supports work requirements and that's true across the board all classes support this idea so I don't think it's true that the the more functional uh, better educated uh, higher status Americans are more permissive the intellectual class is more permissive the academics are more. Well, I was thinking more about marriage, that well, they're more likely yeah. to have yeah. children only That's after true. a marriage. That's true. But perhaps when they look at the rest of society, you know, they're yeah. not going to wag their finger. Uh, that's true. In fact, I wrote a paper recently saying that they have to wag their finger. So I'm supporting Charles on this, mm -hmm. that the upper crust has to preach what they practice, and they are indeed more firm about marriage than they were maybe 20 years ago. When marriage first started to decline in the 60s, it was across the board. But then marriage firmed up among the well-educated, people who were college graduates, typically marry and stay married in the conventional way. And their it children, plateaued or it, um, uh, it, it... It plateaued and didn't get any worse. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, it went on getting worse among the less Wait, educated. Where does it stand with respect to middle-class people who never married but had children? Yeah, I think what all it's, I can't tell you exactly, but it's probably... Um, among the middle class, maybe 20, 30 percent would be born outside marriage. And, and what is the case in Europe? And it, in, in Europe, it's, Europe it, well, in Europe, it's deceptive because in many countries, marriage as a formal institution has disappeared, but cohabitation has replaced it. So, with the same the, sense of obligation to uh, stick pretty together. Pretty much. That is, the cohabiting, cohabiting relationships in Europe tend to be stable and thereby they're functionally equivalent to marriage. That's not true in America. In America, cohabitating relationships typically break up quickly. And so for us, it doesn't appear that there's any real substitute for marriage. Now, the other thing you can advocate, and this is an argument made by Bill Sawhill, a prominent poverty expert at Brookings, she argues that we have to give up on marriage, it's hopeless, we can't restore it, but we can make sure that women uh, have better birth control so that they don't have children just because they're not in control of that. And there are some long-acting versions of birth control that allow you to be uh, make, make yourself infertile for months at a time and thereby not be vulnerable to having a child when you don't choose to. There's no idea that you couldn't choose to have a child, but you shouldn't be forced into it by men that you're seeing who basically just want to have a baby and are not concerned about the future. Uh, you wouldn't lose control in this, in this way. So we don't really have an answer to the marriage problem. I think the answer really is uh, to um, uh, mobilize public opinion. The public does support marriage, they have made these other shifts in favor of higher order. I mentioned higher standards in the schools, uh, welfare reform and work requirements, also tougher uh, criminal enforcement. The public supported all that and did so against the experts. The only area where we haven't done it is marriage. That's the That's one place. That's an interesting question. Um, 
with respect to Europe yeah. especially, but, but also with respect to, to the United <clears throat> States. If people are capable, as they seem to be yeah. in Europe, of forming long-standing bonds without yeah, the formality of marriage. marriage. Yeah. Of course, they don't need to go to a church anymore to no, get married. No. It's simply a question of registering themselves as married. Why are they reluctant to do that? Uh, I don't know. I think the, the church over there has deteriorated worse than here. I mean, more Americans are religious in the sense of church going in America by a long shot than many European countries. There's been decline in both areas. I mean, it's not as if church going in America is as healthy as it once was, but it's well above the European level. Well, what's level. the reluctance to say we're married? I mean, yeah. and people, of course, can still get divorced even yeah. if they're married. Correct. Uh, I guess it's a little more complicated than yeah. simply splitting up, but is, is, that, is that the reason they don't want to say they're married? To avoid talking the European legal uh, entanglement? I, I, don't, uh, I don't know. I think there is probably a greater sense that marriage is old-fashioned, that yeah. we don't really need this, that we can uh, develop a stable relationship. We're all free individuals. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's we're right. Even know. though, as I've been saying, our lives uh, moment to moment. A effective lives really mm -hmm. do not hinge on freedom, mm -hmm. but really on responsibility and freedom and, and an obligation. So here's a case where there is a real difference between America and Europe. And uh, the outcome, however, is similar. That is, in both continents, the single parent person who grows up in a single parent family is uh, disadvantaged compared to two parents. What do you think? I mean, one of the explanations that would kind of occur to me, at least, in thinking why people say, in the case yeah. where they cohabit uh, on a long term basis, but that why they don't want to sort of make a commitment beyond yeah. that in some way, yeah. is this desire to feel like they're free. Yeah. Even if they are responsible, yeah. they still want to well, feel that. Does that have anything to do with, I mean, marriage used to be seen as a divinely sanctioned institution. Yeah, correct. And a person was not entirely free to live their life as what That's they right. wanted because God right. expected them to do things in certain ways. Yeah. Do you think it's secularization that uh, we I, There's an element here? of that. I think that's true. I also think feminism plays a big role. Yeah. Feminism has it's established... The women who are reluctant yeah, to well, In women. general, divorces are, are instituted by women, are they? men. Uh -huh. and, the, and the reason is women, due to feminism and higher education and other trends, have become resistant to, let us call it, old-fashioned marriage, where typically the husband ruled the roost and women took orders from their husbands and deferred to them in various ways and didn't really communicate with them. Uh, that is now, I think most, even those who favor marriage, as I do, accept that that, that has to end that you really can't have marriage on that basis. Marriage has to be more egalitarian where the spouses are on the same level and neither one rules over the other and they work things out rather than just accepting the rule of the other. Uh, but that makes greater emotional advance in some ways than just uh, uh, doing what the other person wants. So a lot of the power to reform and, and, and restore marriage, a lot of that depends upon getting better at dealing with uh, marriage at an emotional level. Uh, and that is something where the culture has actually been reluctant to speak. If you look at the religious texts, and I know just simply the Bible, um, the, there's great support for marriage in principle, but there's almost nothing about how to make marriage work at, at an emotional level. There, there's a generalized idea that it's a great idea, but there's nothing about how to do it. There's much more about how to get along with other people in general, how to get along with God in general, but not about how to get along with your spouse. And what's happened recently, and this is promising, is that people who deal with marriage professionally, for example, counselors, have learned a great deal about what you have to tell people and what they have to learn in order to get along in marriage, after the point when you're just simply in love. I mean, the idea that you get married when you're in love, that's great, but typically the relationship goes on and doesn't, you don't remain in that condition forever. You have to get along on a more long-term basis. How do you do that? Well, there's almost nothing in in our cultural corpus that tells us about that. And so one thing we need to do is be more candid about that. We need to say to people, okay, you want to get married? Here's what you have to learn. And one way that comes up now is in many churches, if you are planning to get married, the clergy offer premarital counseling and the couples have to go and speak to uh, a minister and they typically get asked about issues that might trouble their relationship later such as how to deal with the in-laws, how to deal with money, how to deal with religion, how to deal with uh, children, all those things. Uh, you sort that out in advance so you know you're on the same page before you get married. Okay, That's a good idea. That's a great idea. That ought to be required of everybody, I think, before you get married. Uh, and then the same thing if you, if you are if you're contemplating divorce, 
you should have to establish to a counselor that you've done everything you can to avoid it, that you actually made a serious effort to uh, get along and indeed uh, deal with the issues that have caused you to want to break up. So uh, marriage, and both marriage and divorce ought to be tougher you than they no are today. You think no-fault divorce. Was that? We, we have no-fault divorce uh, now. Correct. I, I would eliminate that. I think, I'm not sure how I would circumscribe it. I don't really know much about that. But above all, you would have to establish to um, a counselor or uh, an agency or wherever, or a church, whatever, that you have made a serious effort to avoid divorce. So no fault, you can just walk out for no, any reason. No. Mm -hmm. See, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of divorces are unnecessary. Uh, spouses come into disagreement about something and they think they can't get along and it's over. Well, it isn't over. I mean, every marriage goes through moments where you think it's hopeless uh, and you can't get along. Well, you, you can't give up at that point. You can't run away. You have to keep trying to work it out. And there's ways to do that. So we need to learn that, and we ought to, we ought to uh, tell students when, when they're in school, uh, we, they get classes now about the sex and marriage to make sure they know about the, the bees and the, the bees and, the, bee and the, 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 uh, the facts of life, let's call it, in a physical sense. That isn't uh, actually the most important thing to learn. The most important thing is, is the stuff about getting along. And that they ought to learn too, and they ought to be uh, instructed on that. So it's not a mystery. Uh, so that's that's and what are I are you the odd man out in the academy oh, on that too? Of course, I mean <laughs> most most people academy. most people certainly academics indeed many Americans mm -hmm. are, are opposed to government getting involved in the marriage question, but the costs of the decline of marriage are simply excessive. I mean it's been too damaging not only to children but also to adults because they if you go through life without a partner, uh, life gets really quite difficult and you become isolated and you're going to be unhappy usually. Now, to be sure, marriage also involves struggle and often unhappiness, at least for a time. It's certainly not easy, but it's the better alternative. And there's every reason to think that that could be a much more successful institution than it is right now. And again, you have to accept that there's some obligation involved here. It's not all about freedom. Many people get married think that it's all about they're going to be happy for the rest of their lives and it's, they're, they're, they're set and they don't have to worry about anything else. It's a fantasy. You have to, you have to work at this like other things. And we need to learn how to do that. Well, marriage is an is an alliance in preparation yeah. for an ordeal, a conflict. Yeah, that's, that's a good. That's a good <laughs> creating yeah. a family. I think that's a that's a, a battle good. that you're going yeah. to be engaged in. Uh, I think that's right. I think there is struggle involved, but if it's dealt with well, then couples can emerge on a stronger ground, and you can actually be get along better and better and better. And things can get better. It's not as if it's hopeless. So that, that what one ought to do, I think when you get married, you're basically making a gamble that you can succeed in getting, getting along for the foreseeable future. And you have to make that gamble wisely and cautiously. You have to be sure you really are able to get along in some basic sense. And then you, gotta, then you have to go for it. You have to say, okay, we're going to do this, and you go for it. But what's, what's in a, do you, I don't know if you know anything yeah. about the state of marriage in a place like Japan. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, mm -hmm. They also, I mean, most rich countries have had rising levels of divorce and single parent. Their birth rates are very low there. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really a separate question. That has mm -hmm. to do with how many children you decide to have. And, and one can argue that, that we need to have more children than we, than we are, actually. Now, in America, that's not so much a problem because we have higher levels of immigration. So we have people coming into the society from outside who maintain our... our uh, our population did more than so because our population is growing. But in Europe, several European countries, and certainly in Japan, the birth rate is below the replacement level. So those populations are to begun to decline. So, and that could be because uh, parents, and especially women, uh, are turning away from the labor of childbirth, which well, is well, considerable. I mean, you, you, would, yeah. you would think that, A, the less reproductive effort a society yeah. engages in, that is to say, less, fewer children yeah. than people wish, or B, the more effort is involved in whatever yeah. the reproductive level is, um, the more the harder the work it is to raise children. Uh, those yeah. two factors would uh, would bear upon how yeah. strong marriage is. Where you want to have a lot of kids, and it's hard to have kids because life is tough. Then marriage becomes yeah. a absolutely indispensable institution. Yeah. You don't want to have a lot of kids, and those kids you have can be raised relatively easily. Then, then marriage becomes much more dispensable. I uh, well, I, I, I think that's, that goes too far. I think if you, even if you have just one or two children, the uh, difference it makes to have two parents is enormous. Uh, the uh, 
problems of a single parent are considerable, even with a single or two child children. Now, it's true that for that person, working is more feasible than it would be with a larger family. One of the reasons why we have been able to require work and welfare at all is because the size of families has dropped dramatically since the 60s. Welfare families, like families in general, are smaller than they used to be. And from the point of view of employment, that's a good thing. It allows it now more, fun, more feasible for the mother to work. Uh, but at a child-rearing level, it's still very much better to have two, ch two parents, even for a single child. And uh, I mean, I shudder to think uh, we have two kids. I can't imagine how my wife would cope. I know in big families, sometimes the older yeah. children, if they're relatively old, yeah. can take a hand in helping the, young, with the uh, younger they ones. True, right? but that's true, but that's often not a good idea from a developmental point of view. Mm -hmm. that the child has to be able to be a child. I mean, my wife is someone who grew up in a family that had significant internal problems, and she became a mother. She had to take care of her younger siblings, uh, and I don't think she really wanted to do that. She did a good job of it. Uh, but that was not a burden she should have she should have borne at that age. Different now that she's got her own kids. So that that is, I really don't think there's a good argument for single parenting here. There really isn't, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we know we really know that life cannot just be about freedom. Life has to involve some obligations. And Charles Murray makes a good argument. He says that he sees in Europe, particularly and in, in, to some extent in America, a fleeing from all obligations which are not in some way chosen. And not even in, and even of those. So people are giving up in marriage. They're also having less to do with their communities. They're not involved in community organizations. In Europe, many people give up in their careers and retire early. Um, in other words, they're fleeing from all their obligations. And in America, that is happening with some groups and in some respects. And that's worrisome. So that's a kind of narcissistic individualism. Well, right? it, it could be narcissistic. It could be just fatalism of some kind taking over. Yeah. It's not clear why people give up on their obligation. Because, in fact, most of the satisfaction of life comes from fulfilling your obligations. That's where the, uh, the rewards are, actually. Just being free is not a source of, of satisfaction to most people. You have to do something. You have to achieve something. And that is uh, where I think um, the, you ultimately reach a, a point where freedom is not the answer. I suppose that's why people, you, you have the yeah. counter trend, I'm thinking yeah. of myself here, of, of people not retiring, yeah, continuing correct. to work, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a place where Americans are actually, in some ways, overcommitted. I mean, there's part of America, the middle class and the educated, who work actually quite hard, and because a lot of their life satisfaction is bound up in that, uh, and they're reluctant to retire. And because health levels are better than they used to be, it's possible for people to work for much longer than they used to do. And without, particularly if they're not not in a physically demanding job where the where the wear and tear of the body is great, um, but for the less educated, uh, there's a tendency to retire early, and and so they are giving up on work, and, and uh, that's really not not helpful to them. Really not a good idea. They should keep working as long as they could, and the withdrawal from employment that we see among less educated men is connected to a big increase in disability programs where people claim to be disabled get support from government, but they're actually able to work in many cases. And I think reformers are now gathering their strength to make an assault on the disability programs and make, make sure that those people are really disabled. And this is also true in Europe. Disability programs are overextended and too many people are just giving up on work. And it's not, and not only is it a social cost, it's a cost for them personally in most cases. This is not a good idea if you want to live a happy life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I hope our, our viewers out there are taking notes on this because I certainly would like them to uh, live a happy life. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that wisdom with us. We really uh, uh, talk about a lot of things, but mm -hmm. uh, w wisdom is, 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 is kind of unique to this sort of discussion, and I think yeah. you provided yeah. a great deal. Good. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for watching.